Welcome! In the last few videos, I talked about Ukrainian independence during World War I and its fight for survival, which was doomed from the start. When the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 1990s, the country was finally free, but it did not mean complete independence. In this episode, I will take a look at the post-Soviet era to see what Ukraine managed to achieve on its own. By 1990, it was obvious that the Soviet Union was on the verge of collapse. Gorbachev's leadership was increasingly questioned, the Soviet premier kept asking for Western financial aid, but the economy could not be reformed and living standards could not be improved without abandoning socialist ideals. It's no coincidence that resistance movements were more vocal in the Baltic countries and Ukraine, as these states had been independent before they were again forced to live under Russian Soviet dominance. Already in January 1990, to voice their discontent, a human chain was formed with 300,000 participants from Kiev to Lviv to commemorate the 1919 unification of the two Ukrainian republics, which signaled the population's desire for real changes. In March, the first relatively free election followed, which was still dominated by the Communist Party, but the newly established Democratic Bloc was able to challenge its authority. In the coming months, the Communists continued to lose popularity, dozens of their deputies declared themselves as independent, and while the majority stayed, the situation further deteriorated. In July, the Declaration of State Sovereignty was adopted, following the Moldavian, Russian and Uzbek example. Ukraine would have its own laws, its own army and national bank, which would issue its own currency. A neutral state was envisioned, without nuclear weapons, although Soviet citizenship could also be kept. Leonid Kravchuk was elected as the chairman of parliament, but Vitaly Masol remained chairman of the Council of Ministers, so communist influence was retained for now. The government planned to sign a new union treaty, which would have transformed the Soviet Union into a confederation, but this provoked a student protest in October. It gradually transformed into a mass movement, with tens of thousands expressing their solidarity, demanding the nationalization of the property of the Communist Party, the resignation of Chairman Masol, along with free elections. Masol was forced to resign, he was succeeded by the ethnic Russian Vitold Fokin as Prime Minister, but the other demands were not met. Before the end of the month, the 1978 Constitution was amended, excluding Article 6, which meant that the Ukrainian Central Committee was no longer the supreme governing body. The Soviet Union still existed, but it was now fragmented, as some republics, like the Baltic states, Moldova, Georgia and Armenia, wanted full independence, while others, like Ukraine, supported the idea of confederation, with some conditions. In Moscow, President Gorbachev tried to gain popular support for his proposal. In March, a referendum was held in the nine republics which participated in the drafting of the new Union Treaty. The majority agreed with the idea, but opposition was strong in large cities like Moscow and Leningrad. In April, the agreement was signed between the Soviet government and the nine republics, but by now, the population of Ukraine also wanted the declaration of sovereignty. The situation remained fluid until August 1991, when communist hardliners in Moscow attempted a coup d'etat. They failed, President Gorbachev soon returned to the capital, but by then, Russian President Boris Yeltsin had much more power, so he was soon ousted. In Ukraine, the parliament declared independence, the Communist Party of Ukraine was banned, but its members continued to rule the country as they had all the important political and business connections. Hundreds of thousands expressed their readiness to serve in the new National Guard. A referendum was then held in December, confirming independence, but in some regions, like Crimea, support was much lower. From Chairman of Parliament, Leonid Kravchuk became President of Ukraine, most communist deputies became independent, while others joined new left-wing parties. Before the end of the year, together with Russian President Boris Yeltsin and Belarusian Chairman Stanislav Shushkevich, 
Kravchuk signed the Belovezh Accords, formally dissolving the Soviet Union and creating the new Commonwealth of Independent States. Not all former Soviet republics joined this new loose coalition. The Baltic countries refused outright, and while Ukraine was not a member, it kept participating in the CIS until 2018, when it officially quit due to the prolonged tension with Russia. August 24 became Independence Day. Poland and Canada quickly recognized the new country, followed by the United States and many others in the next 12 months. Nominal independence was now achieved, but the leaders of Ukraine maintained close ties with Russia, mainly because its economy depended on Russian energy supplies and the huge Russian market. In May 1992, an agreement was signed with American President George H. W. Bush for the full removal of tactical nuclear weapons from Ukraine in return for a $110 million credit line to buy U.S. commodities. This led to the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, which prohibited Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States from threatening or using military force or economic coercion against Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan. The latter three countries gave up their nuclear weapons. They essentially became the front line between the American and the Russian spheres of influence. Kravchuk tried to maintain ties with both sides, cooperating with both the emerging European Union and Russia. He refused to retain the common armed forces and currency inside the CIS. Instead, he favored closer cooperation with NATO and supported the expansion of the Western Alliance, including an immediate Ukrainian membership in 1994. This did not happen for several reasons. Russia would not allow NATO troops so close to its heartland, but the question of Crimea, with its Russian majority, and the naval base of the Russian Black Sea Fleet also remained an important issue. The economy was in shambles. Corruption linked to privatization of entire industries skyrocketed. In 1993, Prime Minister Leonid Kuchma resigned. By the following year, Ukraine's GDP shrank by 40%, so it was no surprise that Kravchuk lost the next election. He was succeeded by Kuchma, who promised to restore economic ties with Russia, along with more pro-market reforms. Under his leadership, subsidies and taxes were reduced, price controls were lifted, banking was reformed. The IMF promised a huge loan, but at the same time, opposition papers were closed, while several political opponents died in suspicious circumstances. In June 1996, a new constitution was adopted, but the country remained fragile and divided, with a significant Russian minority in its eastern oblasts. In 1997, a 20-year agreement was signed with Russia regarding the Crimea. Two separate Black Sea fleets were created, Russia could lease naval facilities there, but it had to respect Ukrainian sovereignty and also paid financial compensation. Kuchma allegedly wanted to move closer to the EU and NATO, but first he had to be re-elected. This he achieved in 1999, but he was accused of electoral fraud, restricting press freedom, and also of ordering the murder of journalist Georgi Gongadze. The cassette scandal erupted in November 2000, when recordings of the president's secret conversations were played, allegedly proving at least some of the charges. The economy was finally growing, but the opposition started a non-violent resistance movement, and Kuchma's approval ratings soon fell to 9%. When Western politicians signaled that the tapes were legit, the president started loosening ties with the EU, moving closer to Russia once again, relying on Vladimir Putin's continued support. I will talk about subsequent developments in another video. If you found this episode interesting, please consider subscribing, it helps me a lot. Thank you for watching, see you next time!